I'm going to talk about visual attention today. And if I'm going to talk about visual attention, um, I need to say a word about um, really the founder of the modern field, uh, Anne Treisman, who died in February. That's Oh, so here, here's the short sociology of science part of today's talk. This is Anne Treisman. This is Mikkel Treisman, her first husband, um, but also a, a quite notable cognitive scientist. Um, she was, until her death, married to Danny Kahneman, um, but she became famous under his last name, which was something of an annoyance to her, and I think more of an annoyance to him, because she was the famous Treisman long after they were no longer um, an, an item. So this is, this is, you may take whatever message you want from that about uh, changing your name if and when you get married or something like that. Um, so yeah, yeah, you know, here's a picture of, of Anne with Danny Kahneman. Um, no, not really. Uh, but with the National Medal of Science, the US highest scientific award, which she got from Obama back when we believed in science. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. The, the starting place for, the mo for modern work on uh, visual search, the problem of how you find what you're looking for in a world full of things that you're not looking for, um, is Anne Treisman's feature integration, uh, feature integration theory. And I'll tell you a bit about sort of the founding data for that, and then the data that leads to um, modifications by people like me and others. My version of the modification is called guided search. I'll tell you about a few problems um, that any model that you want to develop of human visual search behavior would need to solve. Um, and then I'll start trying to tie uh, the problem of search to the broader question of what do you see? What are you seeing right now? What's, what's, the, uh, what's the world look like? Um, and I will end up somewhere in here um, getting beyond simple search tasks where you're looking for one uh, specific target in the world, but we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Um, all right, so uh, let's start with the, uh, uh, what should be intuitively obvious. Um, search is necessary because you simply cannot process all of the visual information in the field at, the, um, at once. Uh, it's a response to the limited capacity of the human visual and cognitive systems. So if you're looking for Waldo, you're having a bad time because this particular piece doesn't have Waldo in it. But if you, if you look for a lion, you can you found, found the lion? Uh, yeah, OK. Um, even after lunch. So. This immediately raises a couple of interesting questions. Interesting question number one, what was there before you found the lion? Right? There was a period of time when that image came up on the screen. You didn't know, you didn't necessarily even know what I was asking for, but you didn't know where the lion was. Eventually, you found the lion. What was there beforehand? It wasn't some sort of black or gray hole. There was some visual stuff there. The contents of that visual stuff we can call pre-attentive vision. That's a term in common use in, in, the, uh, in the literature. We can ask a related problem. Suppose you redeploy your attention someplace else, like to this silly pink bus. Um, now what's here? When you got your attention here, you, uh, you turned this into recognized lion in some fashion. What's there when you move your attention away? Does it revert back to the pre-attentive state, or is it, does it somehow remain lion? Um, and that you could call the problem of post-attentive vision. Um, that's a less common term, but, but, uh, but clear enough. The sort of uh, standard laboratory uh, experiments that really got popularized by Treisman in the late 70s, early 80s, are experiments like this. Um, you put up a stimulus. Observers are going to push uh, a, a key saying, yes, there's a target present, or no, there's not a target present. We're going to vary the number of items on the screen, call that the set size. We're going to measure your response time um, you know, or reaction time. Uh, usually abbreviated as RT. And the interesting data are going to be um, 
the, in particular, the slopes of these uh, reaction, uh, reaction time by set size functions. If you do a task like this, even if I don't tell you what the target is, I didn't tell you what to look for here, but you'd, you'd be, oh, yes, I did. Never mind. Even if I didn't tell you what to look for, it would have been fairly clear that this green thing was the target. And you would not have had, um, you can intuitively imagine that it doesn't matter how many red things there are up there. The slope of that function will be essentially 0. Um, and that works for a variety of basic features. And it doesn't work for combinations of basic features, at least not in quite the same way. Um, what, uh, what Anne originally thought, what Anne Treisman originally thought, was that um, you could process basic features in parallel across the entire field. Um, but as soon as you started combining features, that your search became uh, sequential, serial, and presumably self-terminating. Um, that if you're looking for a red vertical thing, you're going to have to look around until you find it. More uh, red horizontals and green verticals are going to produce a, 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 a steeper slope. Oh, I didn't put any numbers on this, but if you're using great big salient stimuli li uh, like this, um, this is not constrained by um, your eye movements. It's the, 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 the growth here isn't that you have to fixate one after the other. Um, the slopes on, uh, on a really serial visual search might be something like uh, 25 or 30 milliseconds per item. You only move your eyes volitionally three or four times a second, which would produce, obviously, a much steeper slope. Um, so you have a distinction between searches that are extremely efficient with a slope near zero, it's, uh, um, tasks that are not as efficient, um, but it's not just that you have to fixate on things in order to, to know what you're looking at. Um, and uh, if you have items that are defined by how um, elements are put together, so you're getting closer to something that sounds more like object recognition, um, those are also going to produce these inefficient kind of searches if you're looking for a T among Ls, for example. Um, so the original claim of uh, classic Treisman 1980 feature integration theory is parallel search for features, serial search for everything else. The, um, th there were other properties that basic features had that are um, interesting and useful. So if you take a look at this collection of red and green vertical and horizontal um, uh, uh, bars, you will see that they segment into regions pretty clearly, um, right? Yeah, OK. Uh, these regions are probably perfectly nice and obvious to you. Those four are less obvious, if I go back. But um, conjunctions, the conjunctions of basic features don't support texture segmentation in the way that the features themselves do. So there's a clear border between vertical uh, for green and red and, and, and uh, horizontal and vertical. But um, there is a less, what is he doing over here? He snuck in. But here, all the reds are horizontal, all the reds are vertical, all the greens are vertical, all the greens are horizontal. It's, it's divided up into separate regions, but they don't segment. Um, so basic features support texture segmentation. Combinations of features um, don't. Another one of the classic uh, things that features do is they support um, search asymmetries. The presence of a feature is much easier to detect among its absence than vice versa. So if you're looking for the Q among O's, that's uh, convincingly easier than uh, a search for O among Qs. And all of these things have been used as ways of trying to figure out what are the fundamental features um, that are extracted in early vision for purposes of, um, of visual search and visual attention. Um, oh, here's, here's uh, demo time. Try this. This is one of I'm going to flash up a bunch of stuff on the screen. There will be two big red numbers. 
I just want you to say which is the bigger number, the one on the left or the one on, you can't tell me already, I haven't put it up there yet. <laughs> what can I? Yeah, you mean by size or the actual number? Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think I mean the actual number. Now you're making me forget how I made this demo. But let, let's assume it's the actual number. Which, which number is the larger number? OK? On your mark, get set, go. Whoop, go. Left, was it left? OK, that's lovely. I don't care. Um, what I really care about is um, there was a bunch of other stuff there, right? You saw a bunch of other stuff, right? Do you know what you saw? Um, so this is the, 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 the two alternative force choice psychophysics is what we do in the lab. That means you don't get to say, I don't know. You have to say one of the two alternatives. So yes or no? No. No, people are pretty clear on no. Yes. yes. <laughs> OK. I'm, there's not a deep sense of conviction here, um, except on the purple one, I noticed, uh, I think. And that's pretty good. Um, here, what are the answers? Yep, the cue was there. Um, you correctly uh, knew that the, 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 the purple ah, thing was not there. Uh, the yellow one was there. The, blue, the R is not there. The blue one is not there. Uh, what Anne pointed out, and what, uh, this, this is obviously the demo version of something that's a real experiment, um, is that people were pretty good at knowing what the features were that were present. Um, but immediately after the image is gone, um, they were very unclear about how these things went together. They produced what she called illusory conjunctions. So you might be convinced that blue vertical was present because there's blue stuff and vertical stuff. You might be convinced that the R was present because there's a P and that Q has that diagonal that you've stick it on there, you'd get an R. Um, so she thought that the features sort of seemed to flow rather separately. And the, the architecture that she proposed was you've got the stimulus out there in the world, you've got um, a set of feature maps early in the visual system, which in the uh, 1980s uh, you know, were thought maybe to map onto early visual processes. Um, and then if you wanted to do object recognition, if you wanted to just figure out if there was red there, you could get that out of a color map. But if you wanted to do anything else, what you needed to do was deploy your attention there. Um, which some, you know, your attentional spotlight, metaphorically, which allowed you to reach back in a feedback kind of way into the early visual system and bind together all the various different bits of, um, of visual input. I mean, the, 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 historically, where this is coming from is you're finding chunks of the brain that seem to like color or that like orientation or that like motion. And you've got the problem that you don't see color or orientation or motion. You see a red bar moving to the left. How do those features um, cohere together? And uh, the, the key idea here was this idea of binding and the idea that binding was a capacity limited operation that could only be done on one or maybe very few objects at the same time. Now, it's uh, uh, in, modern, in, in modern research, this really gets started in the 70s and 80s. The idea is not entirely new. Um, so here is uh, the French philosopher Condillac, who asked um, back in the 18th century, what would happen if you got up in the morning and uh, threw open the curtains uh, in, a, in a place where you didn't know what's outside the curtains? You know, what do you see when you first see a brand new scene? And he said what you would see is, is, is just, um, well, he would have said um, the pre-attentive features, but he didn't have that language. He said you just see little patches of color and, and, and shape. That, that, that's all you'd get. Only later would you know that you were looking at a hill and a river and, and, and things of that ilk. Um, so let's try that. Here are some curtains. I will fling them open. And you're going to tell me what you see. Uh, ready? Let's see if it'll fling. Okay, what did you see? 
Crosses and pluses, yeah, okay. Pluses, X's, good. What else? Red. Colors, okay. What color? I heard red, green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I gave away the answer here. Um, did you see, which plus did you see? Both, neither, left, okay, uh, uh, oh, right, okay, good, we got all four answers. <laughs> Those are the four logical possibilities. Uh, 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 Tannenbaum's got a, a computer that will generate those. Um, the, the answer is you didn't really know, right? So here's what you were actually looking at. It turns out that both is the correct answer, um, but you really didn't know. And the reason you didn't know is this binding issue that before your attention gets there, um, as Condiac suggested, you knew you had red and green, you knew you had vertical and horizontal, didn't know how they go together. Only once you get attention um, onto an object do those features get bound in a way that allows you to recognize that specific object. Um, let, let's try that again. Uh, look for the one in the next slide, look for the one that's red vertical, green horizontal, um, I, I'll leave it up there this time. It's not just going to be a brief flash. So, um, you ready? So that's the one you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're feeling good because you found it. Now you're feeling like there are kind of several. Like, oh yeah, like half the display. This being the audience that it is, somewhere there's an overachiever here who found the other one. Yeah, it's you, right? Oh, there's several. Right, there's, there's one over, over here. Um, as soon as that image came up on the screen, you knew red and green pluses everywhere. But only once you started scrutinizing individual ones did you bind those features together in a way that lets you know which particular plus was, uh, which particular plus was there. So you had this idea of feature integration with a, a pre-attentive stage followed by um, an attentive stage. There are, um, they're developed in the early 80s when I got into this business. They developed some problems with the basic scheme. Um, in particular, Anne had decided that everything that wasn't a feature search was going to be uh, the, the same kind of serial search. But these kinds of searches, where you were looking at conjunctions of fundamental features, turned out to be fundamentally different than these kind. Um, and uh, a undersighted paper that makes this point in an intuitively obvious kind of way is this paper by Howard Egith, forever at Johns Hopkins, um, and, and uh, a couple of his uh, students at the time. Um, what he said, what he had observers do, was um, look for a T among L's. On some trials, you looked for a T among L's. On some trials, he told you the T's red. And what you discovered was that if you knew that the T was red, the slope um, basically dropped by half if half the items were red. And the reason should be clear enough. If you know that the T is red, there's not much point at looking at black L's. You can use that pre-attentive um, color information now to guide your attention to the only elements that could possibly be the target. Um, you can ramp that up to looking for conjunctive stimuli. If you're looking for a red vertical thing, and some things are red but not vertical, and other things are vertical but not red, here you can try this. Clap when you find a red vertical thing. Yeah, good. And you can clap three times if you want. That's fine, too. Um, what you're doing here, what makes this an easy task, much easier than that task of looking for the pluses, is you can basically say to your search engine, give me all the red stuff, give me all the vertical stuff, and you're allowed to do the intersection operation. And the intersection operation says, well, the most likely, I don't know, I have to bind these features, but the most likely place to find red verticals um, is like here, where there's redness and verticalness. The reason that plus demo is so hard is because if you say, um, you know, give me all the red, give me all the vertical, you get every plus in the field, right? Because they're all, they all have both red and, um, red and plus in them. And so, yeah, okay, so that here, 
So if you're looking for that thing, there's no way to guide yourself on the basis of the basic features. So you just have to start examining them one after the other. And so feature integration theory leads to, in my case, to guided search, which is a fairly modest modification, in fact, on, on the basic architecture that Treisman originally proposed. You've got early visual processes. If you want to recognize and bind an object, you're going to have to um, uh, you're going to have to attend to it, but you're not going to attend randomly. Where you attend is going to be intelligently guided by um, a, a set of, of these, these, these pre-attentive features that you have available to you. Um, it seems useful in this era to say that those guiding features are probably not the you know, whatever 4,000 uh, long feature vector that you get out of your favorite um, neural network. Those are features that are terrifically useful for object recognition, but they are not what you're doing in, um, when you're guiding your attention. Let's see, I think we can illustrate that. Here's, what, here's the sort of features that you do have, and then I'll illustrate um, why it's probably not the case that it's you know, all the vast variety of things that come out of your favorite deep net. Um, the features that you do have are things like orientation, curvature, something about shape that we don't understand, um, and, and some fairly advanced things like lighting direction, or, a, a, or basically th uh, the 3D layout of, of objects. Is, is that a hand? Yes, that's a hand. Yeah, so absolutely everybody's intuition is exactly that. Um, that what you're doing is um, a, a, a staged operation of get one subset and then work through that subset. Turns out not to be true. Um, and the, the way you can show that is do experiments where you force people to do the subset search. So, so instead of saying, look for the green vertical thing, you say, tell me if there's an oddball in the green set. So you have to get the green set and then do basically the same pop-out search within, within that subset. Um, and that turns out to be hundreds of milliseconds slower. The other evidence that that's not what you're doing is, um, so green vertical, that's two features. Well, we can play this game a lot. Um, big green vertical, big green shiny vertical, um, big, green, shiny, jagged vertical. Um, there's a bunch of features, and you can make these higher order, uh, higher order conjunctions. Search gets easier each time you do that um, to a first approximation. Um, it would get slower if you had to do each of those as a separate step. The evidence suggests that you can basically load a set of terms into your search engine and use them all at the same time. And then what's quite interesting is that there are a variety of things that simply don't work. Um, and this actually, in some ways, gets to, um, uh, to the connection between these kind of features and object recognition features. Um, doing object recognition, really useful to be able to uh, pull out um, types of intersections. T intersections typically tell you about uh, occlusion. X intersections don't. Um, searching for X intersections among T intersections is a, a very inefficient search. It's not easy at all. There's no evidence that the type of intersection will guide your attention. Interestingly, um, I said you can say, give me all the red stuff, give me all the um, uh, vertical stuff and get the intersection operation. That works between types of features, but not within. So if you say, I can't even figure out what the target is here. It looks like it's blue and yellow. Say, give me all the blue stuff. Give me all the yellow stuff. You don't get this guy. Um, what you get is, instead of, uh, of, of the and operation that you wanted to do, you get the results of the or. Um, and you get everything. So conjunctions within a feature turn out to be quite inefficient. Um, and then there's all sorts of interesting fights over face, things, uh, uh, faces. Basically. Um, uh, I won't go into the gory details, but I don't think faces um, guide your attention. Here's an example. Look, 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 for, the, uh, look, look for the X intersection right, among 
T intersections. These are the, the, the particular characters are obviously made to balance um, the size and the line segments and stuff like that, but they differ in intersection type. Yeah, yeah, found it, found a few. So there's that one, there's that whole region. So this is another way, of, another, another sense in which it, it doesn't work. If those guys were red, um, that would have just simply jumped out. You would have known that was a red region. Um, I assume that, unless you happen to see this little two-dot artifact, um, that nobody noticed that region when it first came up there because that, those fe that feature does not work to guide attention. Even though it would not be hugely surprising to discover um, that you know, the, 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 the top layer of your network um, that's doing, you know, your Alex Netty kind of network that's doing object recognition might well have units that looked a lot like they were telling the difference between different forms of um, intersection. Um, another important way that you know that these, these features are different from, say, Alex Netty kind of features is, is that what guides your attention um, is both a limited set of features and within those features or within those types of features, it's uh, coarse and categorical in nature. I mean, if you think about having, uh, like you have your own little Google search engine, you know, in a normal Google search engine, I can type any old thing in there and, and, and it'll do good work for me. In your visual search engine, you can only type in a very small vocabulary. It's about one to two dozen types of features. And within that feature, like color, you only get a very few set of, uh, of terms. You don't get to say, um, I would like to guide my attention to all items that are uh, 583 nanometer wavelength lights. That, that's just not going to happen for you, even if you know what that, happen to know what that color would look like. Um, so as an example, look for uh, orientation oddballs here. Which, uh, which, which items attract your attention? You ready? Yeah. No problem, right? Little harder, you got that. Uh, you didn't get that one, right? But once your attention's here, you can tell that that one is a different orientation than this. Um, the physiology, if you look at single cells or you look at, uh, or, or the psychophysics, if you get people in the lab and measure it, you can tell the difference between, um, you know, basically like a degree of orientation. But in terms of guiding your attention, it's more on the order of 10 or 15 degrees. It's coarse. Um, here's, a, here's another version. I'm going to put up a bunch of lines. The targets are tilted 10 degrees to the left of vertical. Um, there will be two of them. So I want you to find both of them. You ready? OK, got two of them? All right, the question is, which one was easier to find? How many people vote that the one on the left was easier to find? How many vote that it was easier to find on the right? All right, left wins by at least three to one, which is good, because that's the answer I wanted. Um, if, it's occasionally doesn't work, and if it doesn't work, I can always revert back to the data. But the qu what's the difference here? The difference is that this guy's easier, that guy's harder. This guy is easier because it is the categorically steep item in the, in the display. The targets are tilted plus and minus 50 degrees, so they're 40 degrees and 60 degrees away from the um, the target. The distractors are 40 and 60 degrees away from the target. Over here, this is the steepest thing, but these guys are steep. It's also a left tilted item, but these guys are tilted to the left. And it turns out that that's more difficult. Um, because it looks like what you can say to your search engine is, give me the steep stuff, or give me the stuff that's tilted to the left. You don't get to say, I want the steepest stuff. You don't get to say, I want 45 degree items. It's very coarse. Now, we haven't worked that out in every feature under the sun, but it's true in, in size. It's true in color. It looks like um, the, oh, the way to think about this is you've got the front end of the visual system, which is doing um, 
all that feature extraction that allows you to do extremely fine detailed um, uh, object recognition eventually, you know, a lot of detail in there. But there's a very coarse abstraction of those features that's, that w is what you are using to guide your attention around. Now remember, you're doing all this, th this is, presumably that's because you're doing all of this in the service of severe capacity limitations. You want to be quick and dirty about this. It's not mostly going to be that useful to you to say, um, I want to find items of exactly this shade of red. You say, I want red. And within the set of red things, OK, now I can use my um, built-in deep net to figure out exactly which red item it is that I want. I can go through 30, 40, 50 objects a second in object recognition land, um, the evidence suggests. Um, so I don't need to do this guidance business precisely. I just need to get into the neighborhood. I just need not to waste time on things that are never going to be my target. Um, oh, there are not all the rules are desperately clear. Um, so in each of these displays, there is a um, one elephant that is different from all the others. Right? Which which side is easier? That it's easier to find a dead elephant among live elephants than a live elephant among dead elephants. Right? Okay, that's that's a classic version of a search asymmetry. The rule is that the presence of a feature is easier to detect than the absence. Oh, great. Like, what's the feature here? Deadness? Uh, it's not, th there's a whole bunch of control experiments that I'm not going to show you. It's not just weirdness. It's not just pointy upness. We have no idea what the answer is. But um, you know, it's probably not the project you want to work on for this for this uh, course, but if anybody figures out why dead elephants are easier to find than live elephants, let me know. Um, and oh, so this is what th this is what those sort of data look like. Looking for a dead elephant among live elephants is uh, you know that that slope is only five milliseconds per item. Live among dead is about three times that. I don't know why. Um, so. The elephant problem is not really one of the deep problems in the field. There are more interesting problems. Um, here is one of them. Uh, clap. Here's an, an, another demo. Uh, clap for a T. Ready? Ready. Oh, there we go. That's good. There is not a T. Now, at some point, I even heard somebody say there's not a, you know, no T. Um, how do you know that? Well, the obvious uh, answer would seem to be, oh, I to put this animation, that you would go through and cross out all the items until you, I, please tell me I didn't put one on every blessed T here, L here. Stop. Anyway, that you would go through and exhaustively cross everybody out. And when you'd crossed everybody out, you knew it's time to quit. Right? At some point, you're going to know it's time to quit. It, if, if you don't find what you're looking for, it would be desperately stupid if you simply got stuck and, and, and could never move on. Uh, oh, good, we can move on. But so that, the, what, what this is known as is inhibition of return. Um, inhibition of return is an uh, um, interesting phenomenon in the attention business where if you can show that attention has been here, and moved away, it is indeed harder to get attention back to a previously attended location than to get it to a new location. Um, Ray Klein at Dalhousie has been working on this for many years. Um, but that's not what you're doing. How do we know it's not what you're doing? Well, here, let's do an experiment like this. We're going to have you looking for a T among L's. We can make life a little more difficult by making them a little jagged, but it's the same basic task. And Every 100 milliseconds, we're just going to random replot re the locations of every item. So if there's a T present, it will be present on every frame. Um, but the location will be randomized 10 times a second. Obviously, you cannot at that point be marking the locations that you rejected. It's just not going to work. 
So the only thing you can do is, you know, when it's time to grab a new one, you grab a new one. If it's a T, you're good. If it's not a T, you keep going until you quit at some point. Um, so that is sampling from the display with replacement. Inhibition of return, this story is sampling from the display without replacement. If you, what, um, what do the data look like? If you simply say, how long does it take you to say, yes, there's a T, or no, there's not a T present? Um, so the static version, the standard version, is, is the green data. The red data is what you should get if you go from sampling without replacement to sampling with replacement. But the blue and black lines are two versions of, uh, of the everything's flickering around 10 times a second experiment. It really doesn't make any difference. It's very odd. You would think that if, every, you know, if, if, if I was looking for, for Gabriel, let's say, and everybody in the room was changing positions 10 times a second, you would think that would make my life more difficult. But in this experiment, it doesn't. So you're not going through and um, inhibiting items one after the other and deciding on that basis when to quit. So what do you do? Um, well, a way to think about what you're doing in search is to think of it as really two decisions um, or a, 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 a sort of an iterative process of, of, of a pair of decisions happening over and over again. You pay attention to an item and you've got essentially a signal detection problem. Is this a target or is this not a target? Um, and that, you know, if it's, if for most of the things I've shown you here, that's an easy uh, task. You have no trouble deciding if something is a T or an L. If we switch to um, my medical side of the world, you're attending to this thing and the question is, is this cancer or not? Um, the signal detection part's gonna be much more difficult, but you're basically doing a little signal detection task. If the answer is yes, you've found your target. If the answer is no, you have to decide whether it's time to quit. Um, and rather than going through and saying, I'm marking everything, what you seem to be doing is accumulating some sort of evidence to some variety of a quitting threshold. That quitting threshold gets set on the basis of your understanding of the task. Um, you know, how likely is it that there's something there? If I never find something, you know, if this is a task where there's simply never anything there, I'll have a relatively fast quitting threshold. So if I don't find it, I'm not gonna waste time on it. If I know my damn keys are in the bedroom, that quitting threshold goes way up there because I'm gonna hunt until I find them. Um, but it's a different kind of probabilistic process, not, a, uh, not a, an inhibition of, uh, of return. Um, okay, here's another uh, problem that, so anybody who wants to build a search engine that behaves like the human search engine needs to figure out how you're gonna quit when the, when you, if and when you don't find the target. Here's another thing you're gonna have to um, uh, figure out. So we've got this notion that um, you, you're, you're doing this object recognition, object binding kind of thing. Um, and the slope of those functions is essentially a rate function, right? If the slope is um, a, a, you know, 20 milliseconds an item, that means every second, 50 items are somehow getting through this, uh, um, this bindery. And the, the data on searches like searching for a T among L's tell you that you're doing something on the order of 20 to 50 objects per second, really fast. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, the problem is that uh, if you do studies of just straight up object recognition, nobody thinks you can do it that fast. The estimates of how long it takes to go from uh, a stimulus on the retina to, uh, to recognition are, um, the fastest you get is like 100 milliseconds or so and, and, and probably somewhat more than that. So there, there's, there's a gap there. Is that, that, that's not a hand? No, okay. It's like an auction, you know, you make the wrong gesture and you, you, you um, um, the, uh, whoop. So there are a couple of positive, there are multiple possibilities for what you're doing here. One possibility is that every time you move your eyes, let's say, in a display like this, 
you grab a bunch of items and that you can bind those guys in parallel. And then you move your eyes again in series and bind the next bunch in parallel. So sort of a clumpy version. Um, our version of the story is, uh, is somewhat different. We think that um, you only actually attend to one item at a time, or you select one item at a time. And um, each one of those starts accumulating object recognition e kind of information. So let's, some, and, and you can imagine some sort of a diffusion process. Maybe that's the boundary for T's, and that's the boundary for L's. And you grab this guy, and it starts diffusing towards an L boundary. And this guy is headed for an L boundary. Eventually, you get that one, which is going to be your target. Um, but at any given moment, so one after the other, but at any given moment, if you slice through this, you'd be processing multiple items in parallel. It's not that radically different from this. The way to think about this is, look at that, is as a, a car wash or a pipeline in computer science la language. But think about a car wash. Cars go into that um, machine one at a time. So it's, a, it, it's in that sense serial. If I bomb this car wash, how many cars am I going to destroy? I'm going to destroy a bunch of them because several of them are being washed in parallel. Um, and we think, it's hard to prove, but we think that that's what's going on when you're doing search tasks, that you're going through and um, uh, loading, loading up this car wash one after the other, and then multiple items are in there at the, uh, at the same time. So, all right, I said that. OK, so let's, uh, let's say a bit about how this relates to, um, uh, to this question of, well, what are you actually seeing right now, whether or not you're actually searching for something? OK, so back to Waldo land. Go find some down there. Run your nice object in, into bears. Um, and what makes Waldo problems uh, uh, good is that he figured out how to thwart your crowded, lots of shared features. Front end of the vision, uh, front end of the process, massively parallel early visual processing. At some point, there's a mandatory, very tight bottleneck um, that's uh, that, that, that's sort of guarded by this guiding representation with a few features in it. Um, you bind the features and you get and and you get your bear. But going back to the initial uh, the initial where's Waldo picture. You were seeing something everywhere, right? You, 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 that, that bottleneck um, on object recognition, but you're seeing something everywhere else. Um, and one way to think about that is to think about two pathways that are contributing to your uh, visual awareness. It is tempting, um, but uh, speculative, to try mapping this onto, say, a ventral pathway and, and uh, you know, what's and where's and things like that. Um, but um, in psychophysical terms, at least, you've got this selective pathway that can do object rec recognition. And you've got a non-selective pathway that's giving you visual stuff everywhere um, and is contributing. Um, so, uh, Condiac's version of this in the 18th century was to say you're just getting little patches of color everywhere. Um, more recent work is telling you that this non-selective pathway, notably by people like Ode Oliva at MIT, um, this non-selective pathway is giving you um, more than just little local patches of color. You can also get some semantics out of that. So the gist of the scene, did I put a gist demo in there? No, not quite. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, the result of this is the illusion that at any given moment you are seeing a world full of understood objects. Um, and so, so to ma imagine what's going on. You've got this non-selective pathway giving you something everywhere. You've got this selective pathway that one way or another is giving you 20, 30, 40 objects per second, bouncing around all over the place recognizing stuff. The, conscious experience is um, I'm seeing everything everywhere. The way to show that that's not the case 
are um, the, the classic demos. How, how many people have seen change blindness demos at some point? Most people. It doesn't matter. Here's a change blindness demo. What changed other than the orientation? I know that. Normally in a change blindness demo, you'd put a blank in there. Um, the, uh, you don't need a blank frame. There's no blank in, oops, there's no, which way is back? There's no blank in there, but the, the orientation shift will also mask the transient that'll tell you the change. Has anybody found the change yet? No. Since it doesn't matter, your undergraduate education, completely wasted. You learned all about change blindness. Um, OK, if we take out that orientation shift so that you'll see the transient, you will see that this is not subtle. Boop, boop. Yeah, come on. And of course, if I go back here, now you can see it just fine, right? It's not a subtle change. Um, the reason it's interesting is uh, because of this illusion that you have that you're seeing stuff everywhere all the time. It wouldn't be, if, if I said, you have back of the head blindness, right? You don't know, but Tannenbaum's busy making horrible faces right now, and you didn't even notice that. You know, you say, that's really boring. I can't see behind my head. Um, Josh is looking behind to see if he's, if he's, if, what, what, what? Oh, okay, that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> see if the, we'll see how that works. Um, anyway, um, but so you, you, you know, intuitively you understand that um, he's gone. It's amazing. Um, it, you intuitively understand that you can't see behind your head, right? But you don't understand that you can't see what's right in front of your eyes. And that becomes a, uh, an unfortunate surprise. Now, that's a lovely surprise in intro psych kinds of lectures. It has real implications out in, um, in the real world. And here's an example. Um, this, so I, I work at, uh, actually both Gabriel and I work in, in, in the Harvard medical uh, system based in hospitals, God bless us. Um, and I hang out with radiologists quite a lot. This is one slice through a, a chest CT. Um, those are the lungs, the white blob would be the heart. You're for signs of lung cancer in this case. Um, this is a particularly obvious one. They're basically like golf balls in the lung, little teeny golf balls, um, that uh, lung nodules are what you'd be looking for. And we did an experiment where we had um, radiologists searching for um, uh, these lung nodules while we're tracking their eyes. It's all very nice. On the last frame, as some of you will have noticed, uh, on last case, uh, we put a gorilla in the lungs. Uh, how many people have seen the great gorilla demo in that same class where you saw the change blindness stuff? That's why we used a gorilla, right? It's an homage to Dan Simons and his gorilla. Um, if you're a radiologist looking for lung cancer, your instructions, or, or anything else for that matter, your instructions are look for the thing you're supposed to be looking for and tell us if there's anything else clinically significant there so-called incidental findings. Um, a gorilla the size of a matchbook in your lung is clinically significant. Um, a little unlikely, but clinically significant. Uh, 20 of our 24 radiologists failed to report it. Um, important note, this is not that we had bad radiologists, but they're working with the same search engine that you're working with. And the result is, um, that they will miss things that are literally right in front of their eyes. We're tracking their eyes. They fixated on that gorilla um, for a full second on average and still did not, um, still did not report it out. And it's not just this, 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 these situations where you get um, a failure to see uh, errors. You know, how could this happen? It was right in front of your eyes. Um, these happen all the time. They can be catastrophic, and they end up in court. Uh, so uh, as an example, a uh, um, woman comes around uh, 
uh, the, the bend on her motorcycle out on a rural road, um, and a um, uh, quarter mile of clear road in front of her slams into a pickup truck, and I, I think she was killed, actually. How could she fail to see a pickup truck that's just sitting right there? Right? Well, the problem was, in this particular case, that it was sitting right there. Um, the, the truck had come to a stop in the middle of a rural highway because the woman in the truck was talking to a friend in the, the front yard. And this woman, presumably, the woman who was killed, came around the bend, probably attended to that truck, said, I understand about trucks on highways. They're moving was still looking at the whole scene, but not attending to the truck. By the time she attended to the truck again, having attended to whatever else she may have been attending to, she did not notice, in this case, the absence of a change um, until it was too late. So she could slam into something that was clearly visible because of this illusion that we can see, um, that we can see everything. Um, and and this, these sorts of things, uh, I, I know about these things coming up because every now and then a lawyer calls me and says, I've got a defendant um, uh, or a plaintiff, uh, uh, you know, th 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 the accident involves, oh my God, how could you not see that? Um, and and this, is, this is how you could not see that. Oh, if you've never seen the gorilla experiment, just to remind people, um, you're watching a, a, a ball game and um, the, uh, you're told to count the number of times the white team counts the ball. And in the middle of that video, a gorilla walks through. It's not a real gorilla. She's in a gorilla suit. It's OK. They got it through the Human Subjects Committee, um, pounds on her chest, and walks out. And 50% of people fail to report seeing a gorilla when you, when you query them afterwards. And of course, everybody can see it the second time. Right, you know, the, one of the interesting aspects of this is the next time you, particularly if I'm giving the talk, the next time you see a piece of lung CT, you're gonna be looking for a gorilla. You'll never get fooled by that one again, and, and you won't be fooled by the amazing disappearing angel either. But I could go onto my laptop, find another six versions of, of these sort of things and bamboozle you. Um, it's not something that you can immunize yourself against. It's simply part of the structure of the way the human system is, um, is put together. Um, all right, let's see, looking at that. Yes, OK. Um, I'll do one last demo to make one last point here. This, this, this is uh, lung nodules for non-radiologists. I told you that the radiologists are looking for little golf balls. Um, but just to, uh, um, to, I can't get you to look for nodules, so look for golf balls. All right, success. Got that one? Feel good about that one? Did you find those five? Oh, good for you. Have we met before? No, oh, even better for you. <laughs> okay, that's great. Did you get that one too? Okay, so I still win. <laughs> um, so, and, and by the way, this is another problem you actually don't want to work on for the month because it would only take you half an hour. You could write a piece of code that would find um, golf balls in this image with no problem. And it would be much happier with that one, which is a nice high contrast golf ball, than either of the two on the green. Um, what's the problem here? Rather like the radiologists, you are also experts, but you, um, you're experts on the real world. You're, you're, you're mini golf experts. You know. And this is, a, this is an important different form of guidance. You know where golf balls um, could be and should be. Um, and they could and should be on the little golf course here. And they shouldn't be floating up in, in, in the sky there. And um, in the real world, I forget who was asking about uh, real scenes before, or somebody over there. Um, in the real world, this scene guidance is a profound uh, constraint on where you put your attention. I sort of alluded to that before, but it, it, I, we should underline that point here. Um, if I'm looking for people, I'm going to look on a ground plane where, um, where uh, people are likely to be. I'm not going to waste time 
on uh, uh, looking for people hanging from the ceiling. On the rare occasion, mostly in lectures like this, where there is somebody hanging from the ceiling, you'll get fooled. But most of the time, this is a very useful um, a shortcut, again, dealing with the capacity limits on your, your visual system. And you desperately don't want, to, so it's a problem because you miss things, you, you miss weird stuff. This is a, a, a medical problem, it's a problem in the intelligence community. Um, you're gonna end up missing the golf ball in the wrong place. Um, but you really don't want to take away the message, oh, this sort of scene guidance stuff, it's a disaster, I don't want to do it. So when you get into an Uber, you really, really don't want the Uber driver who doesn't believe in scene guidance, right? And is driving down the highway saying, I wonder where the exit sign is. It could be in the sky. I wonder if it's at my feet. You know, that guy's going to kill you. Um, what you want under most normal circumstances is you want to deploy your limited resources in as intelligent a manner as you can get away with. And um, that'll get you in trouble in lectures like this. And unfortunately, it will also get you in trouble in a variety of settings, medical settings and things like that. And an interesting frontier, so one possibility is We'll, we'll build that uh, deep net that simply does radiology um, and end of, end of story. More likely, we'll figure out how to, uh, to pair smart AI with smart um, experts in a way that cuts down on these sorts of errors, which is not a, that, a separate lecture to talk about the details of why that's not trivial. Um, I think I'll stop there and not talk about hybrid search, which is very cool, but you need to get to the beach. So ask a couple of pithy questions and then everybody can go to the beach. So thanks. <laughs>